It may quite easily be true that this sense of unity, this compact of our better natures must first be attained through art, through that which has traditionally been the most potent agent for making the universal appeal and inducing people to forget their differences. Jane Addams on Art. A settlement is a protest against a restricted view of education. Jane Addams on Education. On March 6, 2021, Jane Addams Hall House Museum partnered on a program with the National Arts Education Association's Community Arts Caucus. The program began with a tour led by Hull House Education Manager Michael Ramirez, who gave an overview of the history of the Settlement House while also establishing their stance on arts education. The program then featured a conversation with Sarah G and Aram Hansi Fuentes, two artists slash activists featured at the museum. In September 2019, Jane Addams Hall House Museum opened True Peace, The Presence of Justice, featuring prison abolitionist and community organizer Sarah G. Her contribution to the exhibition features photographs that document the extensive social justice organizing in Chicago from the past 10 years. Focusing on Black women in Chicago, her work serves as a powerful visual record of the legacy of resistance and activism of those who are often erased or rendered invisible. In March 2020, Hull House updated Sarah G, displaying a display adding her documentation of the fall 2019 Chicago Teacher Union strike that demanded equitable access to education. Sarah G is a, Korean, is a queer Korean mama organizer and photographer who has been documenting freedom struggles in Chicago since 2010. She is a member of Love and Protect, a grassroots organization that supports women and gender non-conforming non-binary people of color who have been criminalized or harmed by state or interpersonal violence. Sarah intentionally focuses her documentation work on everyday people, imagining and building a world rooted in love and resistance, a world where we don't need prisons and police, she hopes that these images of resistance and reimagination will plant seeds in others to join the work of collective liberation. Thank you, Sarah. Hey, everyone. Thank you so much for that introduction. Um, thank you so much for everyone for being here and inviting me to share this space with you all. Um, so I am a CPS parent um, and I don't have formal training as an artist or a photographer, but my work um, currently is informed by the communities with whom I have been in solidarity with in struggles for justice in our city. Next slide. So what you're seeing here is the first photo I ever took as part of the work that would become Love and Struggle Photos. It's a banner from the La Casita struggle a little over 10 years ago, which was a 43-day, 24-7 occupation at Whittier Dual Language Academy in Pilsen, where the parents and community were fighting the planned demolition of a school field house that was a beloved community center, which they turned into a library during the occupation. Next slide. So after that struggle, I began documenting mostly the education justice movement, uh, which was actually a place of many intersecting struggles in Chicago, from racial justice to economic justice to migrant justice, et cetera. Next slide. And it was really through the education justice community that I was introduced to the idea of abolition especially through the work of Miriam Kaba, a longtime educator and abolitionist organizer who soon became a close friend and mentor. Next slide. So part of the work of abolition is rethinking what safety actually looks like and countering the idea that police and prisons keep us safe. One of the photo projects that I did in collaboration with Miriam Kaba was the Community Safety Looks Like project where we asked Chicagoans what community safety looks like to them and to write their answers on a whiteboard, which I then photographed and Miriam would put on her Tumblr, which you can look up at communitysafetychicago.tumblr.com. It was around this time that I also became part of an effort called um, We Charge Genocide, which was started in June of 2014 as a response to the murder by Chicago police of Dominique Damo Franklin, 
who was a beloved friend to many of the youth organizers in the city that people like Miriam and I knew. So this was um, right before the murder of Mike Brown and the uprisings that began in Ferguson and then spread across the nation. And criticism of police violence and policing as an institution entered mainstream discourse. So that fall, black and brown young organizers from We Charge Genocide went to the United Nations during the session of the Com Committee Against Torture to draw attention to police violence in Chicago, which particularly affects black and brown youth. They also wrote a shadow report to the UN charging the Chicago Police Department with genocide. And I can't stress enough how important the work of these young organizers in We Charge Genocide would be to laying the foundation for the continuing work of abolition here in the city. Next slide. I was also part of For the People Artists Collective and um, one of several FTP artists who curated the community-based multi-site exhibition called Do Not Resist, 100 Years of Chicago Police Violence. We had teach-ins, workshops, performances, panels in which we covered um, policing and state violence, but also centered community healing and actively imagined and envisioned abolition. Next slide. So fast forward to the uprisings that happened this summer in response to the police murders of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and others. At this time, young black abolitionists in Chicago came together as the Black Abolitionist Network to call for the defunding of the Chicago Police Department. This call is directly descended from the No Cop Academy campaign, which was made up of Chicago youth calling out then Mayor Emanuel's plan to build a $95 million cop academy in the already heavily policed West Side. Defund CPD has been the unifying rallying cry for many community and grassroots organizations for the past nine months here in Chicago. And currently there is outrage that our mayor, Lori Lightfoot, has spent over 65% of federal CARES emergency funds during COVID on the police to the tune of $280 million. Next slide. So, <laughs> Thanks. So I want to end um, just with a few quotes that I think help frame how we as artists and educators and parents can envision abolition. The first is by poet Martin Espada, who says, no change for the good ever happens without it being imagined first, even if that change seems hopeless or impossible in the present. The second is by abolitionist scholar and geographer Ruthie Wilson Gil Gilmore. She says, abolition requires that we change one thing, which is everything. Abolition is not absence, it is presence. What the world will become already exists in fragments and pieces, experiments and possibilities. Abolition is building the future from the present in all of the ways we can. Miriam Kaba often quotes Ruthie on this, and she does it in the end of her essay, So You're Thinking About Becoming an Abolitionist, and I quote, changing everything might sound daunting, but it also means there are many places to start, infinite opportunities to collaborate, and endless imaginative interventions and experiments to create. Let's begin our abolitionist journey, not with the question, what do we have now and how can we make it better? Instead, let's ask, what can we imagine for ourselves and the world? If we do that, then boundless possibilities of a more just world await us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Saraji. In 2016, uh, during a polarized and bewildered election season, Jane Addams Hall House Museum launched official unofficial voting station, voting for all, all who legally can't with artist Aram Hansi Fuentes and collaborators. As a le legal alien of the United States who is barred from voting, Aram Hansi Fuentes official unofficial voting station inserts 
an unsanctioned voting process into the year's election season. The project is an, uh, is an objection to the exclusion of herself and others from central democratic processes. Excuse me, I lost my place. <laughs> the following year, during a present, presented inauguration, Hull House served as the first hub of Sequentes' protest banner at Lending Library, in part inspired by Hull House Settlement Art Lending Library. Aram Han Sequentes is a fiber, social practice, and performance artist who works to claim space for immigrants and disenfranchised communities. Her work often revolves around skill sharing, specifically sewing techniques to create multi ethnic and intergenerational sewing circles, which become a place for empowerment, subversion, and protest. Her work has been exhibited at leading cultural centers around the globe. Aram is a 2016 Smithsonian Art Research Fellow, 2016 Three Arts Awardee, and 2017 Sustainable Arts Foundation Awardee. She earned her BA in Art and Latin American Studies from the University of California, Berkeley, and her MFA in Fiber and Material Studies from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. She's currently an adjunct associate professor at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. Thank you, Aram. Thank you so much for having me here um, and inviting me to this panel. And yeah, thank you, Sarah G, for your beautiful talk. It's hard to follow up. <laughs> but I'm gonna jump into my presentation. Um, there we go. So there's me. Um, so my goal as an artist is to disrupt, unsettle, and rupture dominant narratives to assert, demand, and claim space for those who are commonly othered. And as Paulina mentioned, particularly um, being an immigrant of color myself, um, that is the particularly the community that I work the most with. So I'm gonna jump into the Purchase Banner Lending Library. So um, I started this project really the the day after um trump you know the results came out that trump won and um for the 2016 official unofficial voting station at hull house um i was already making an installation of sort of these in the language of purchase banners so i was already thinking a lot about purchase banners and so i started making them immediately and asking people to come and make them with me and as i mentioned my community, right, and those who I usually make art with are predominantly non-citizen immigrants of color and with the majority being undocumented folks. And so, um, yeah, and so that that was interesting in that um, we were making all of these banners and there was a moment where it was like, okay, there's all these protests happening, who wants to take them out? And there was um, just such fear that people had that, you know, they they feared going to a protest because they were from such a vulnerable community, and you know, an arrest could could uh, quickly um, complicate their status here, right, or being here. So um, that's when then I was like, wait, why do we make all of these banners, right? Um, and and everyone, you know, shared the sentiment that like it was really important for them to be used, and so. That's how it turned into a purchase banner lending library was that first, it was really these just organic making right coming from an urgent need to make it these banners in response to what was happening. And then how it became a library was because of that right because a lot of um, vulnerable people or from these communities were making the banners with me. And we really wanted to them to go out into the world, and so I was thinking about that and then. Um, you know, knowing that the Jane Addams Hull House Museum actually had an art lending library dur during um, the settlement years, I was like, oh, if we turn this into a purchase banner lending library, then these can go out there. So, like I said, um, the con project has continued and it continues today, and the workshops become a really important part of this. So, I do workshops, pre free public workshops all over the US and internationally, where I teach people how to make their own purchase banners. It takes about an hour and a half to two hours to make. And the workshop scale sharing component has become importantly pedagogical. The workshops in the space they create address people's immediate desires to create banners for themselves and others to use in protests. And it also places the skill of making purchase banners in the hands of the participants where they have the skills to continue making them for themselves and their communities and for their art practices. And these workshops have become such an important part of my practice because it is where I am nourished I feel immense joy and power when I make art with my communities. And in many non-Euro Western cultures, art is made collectively, right? Not by an individual. 
Um, making art together creates spaces for our knowledge connected through lived experiences to be shared and uplifted. And these spaces of collective making become radical spaces to talk, listen, um, validate each other, share stories and resources, um, talk through different politics, right? Uh, learn about the self and others and playfully come up with strategies to live and fight. So as I mentioned, um, so the workshops are important. And then the second part of the project are, is this physical lending library, as I mentioned before. So um, yeah, so in our collection, I've done like several residencies where we have open hours to the public. Um, and we, I have a physical or multiple physical lending libraries of these banners. So in Chicago and various cities all over the world. And so we estimate that more than 2,500 banners have been made in the workshops. And currently in the various lending libraries, there's more than 600 that are in um, the libraries, like I said. So they're constantly being checked out and used. And actually this photo was from last week from the HANA Center in Nakasak, who've been doing actions uh, calling for citizenship for all, right? And so uh, these banners or so people make these banners, um, they, they, they can get, um, sorry, I'm just like, lost my notes real quick. So, you know, it's interesting, because also, like I said, that part of them being checked out and used, they get checked out in various ways, um, like at protests and marches and political actions, but they also get checked out at conferences, public talks, presentations, performances, retreats, exhibitions, classrooms, fundraiser events, and people just tell me that they put it in their room, right? So there's no time frame for people to return the banners and there's no late fees for people. Um, so some never come back and some come back damaged, but you know that's all a part of um, protests, right? And so the words in these banners have a growing history. They're made by someone used in a protest, returned to the library, and then taken by someone else to a different protest. And the banners carry the histories of the hands that made them hold them and the places where they've traveled. So I'm gonna quickly talk about the next project, um, which is the official unofficial voting station. So I started this in 2016 because I wasn't able to vote because um, I wasn't a citizen then. And I continued this project. At, I just finished it in 2020 as well. And so a little bit about disenfranchised communities is that um, in, in 2016, more than 28.6% of the population was ineligible to vote, right? So that's youth under 18, non-citizens, depending on your state, incarcerated people and formerly incarcerated people, right? Because in some states like Virginia and Kentucky, if you uh, were incarcerated, you lose the right to vote forever. Residents of US territories, people without IDs, and also in certain states, um, people with um, guardianships. Right. And so if we look up the makeup of who's disenfranchised, right, it's a lot of people of color um, and those with disabilities and those, you know, yeah, like non citizens without with without citizenship. Which, and the list doesn't even uh, talk about voter suppression. Right. And so in 2016, um, I connected with various artists all over the US and Mexico and we created different voting stations. Uh, for those who can't legally vote. And they're really experimental because, you know, if we're going to reimagine voting, we might as well, you know, we don't want to create polling places and we want to reimagine it completely so they could be playful and fun. Right. And so um, these are my collaborators in Mexico. And we had various parties on election day, right? Because that's usually a day where the disenfranchised are silent, right? And invisible. And rather than that, we wanted to just take up as much space and be as loud as possible. So those are the results from 2016. And then um, the difference with the 2020 elections was that I worked with uh, different artists in Chicago and we created 50 voting kits for the disenfranchised that anyone could request and to create their own voting stations. Of course, the pandemic got in the way a little bit, but actually all 50 went out into the world and were used. And so here's a couple examples. This is Carol Zoshi um, was driving around with a ballot box at the back of her motorcycle in LA um, and uh, collecting symbolic votes there. 
And we also created a website, which is officialunofficial.vote, and I'll share that in the chat. Thank you. Thank you, Michael, Sarah G, and Aram for sharing your work with us. Um, we are going to have a little bit of a conversation, a uh, discussion. Um, those of you who are in the audience, if you would like to um, ask questions to our presenters, to our speakers, please place them in the chat. And I think we're a small enough group that maybe we can just go ahead and open it up for discussion at some point, you know, just amongst ourselves, because at least those of us that are in the Zoom session. Um, to get us started, I did have a couple of questions, the things that came up in conversation between both of your presentations and then just other questions. Um, one of the things that I think really resonated, right, is this idea of uh, imagining worlds, imagining worlds otherwise than they currently are, right? And Sarah G, you spoke to that through some of the work um, that you've uh, learned in relationship uh, to the work of Miriam Kaba. Kaba. Um, and I'm wondering, right, like you mentioned briefly that you weren't trained necessarily as an artist and that you came into this work as a CPS parent. Um, and I'm wondering um, how, what are the, what are the conditions or the situations that enable us to, as artists or as artists who work in communities, um, to develop, uh, and Aram said, you know, to talk, to listen, to share, to learn about self and others and to develop strategies to live and fight to be able to enact and imagine these otherwise worlds. And so I wonder if you can both maybe speak to that and perhaps Michael, if you can speak to that from the perspective of the legacy of the Jane Addams Hull House Museum. Take a moment to think about it. <laughs> yeah, um, you know, you mentioned that I came into this work as a CPS parent, and um, and I, I also was not even politicized at the time. Um, like I was basically your middle of the road liberal living on the north side, um, who um, had no idea about the different struggles that have been going on, you know, for decades in Chicago, um, and um, so coming into that um, with the background that I had, you know, um, that's something that I've, I've had to like basically learn everything from scratch, you know? Um, and so it's, it's been an interesting 10 years of doing that. Um, but I think it also gives me hope in terms of like, you know, how do people enter the work, you know? Um, and for me, I related to these parents on, in Pilsen because I had a child in CPS. And so I became really interested in public education because I made that decision um, to, I made a, basically a commitment to public education for my child. And, and then I started learning about what public education looked like in Chicago. And I was like, oh my goodness, you know, I think I'm gonna have to do some research here, you know? Um, and that's basically what led to my activism. Um, it, it was really because of my daughter, you know? And I think that it's common for most people that um, you become politicized based on what affects your personal life and what impacts you materially. Um, like, I think that that's a common entry point for people into becoming politicized or just being connected to their community, you know? And so for me, I lived in Rogers Park and this was a community in Pilsen, but because of this common value for, you know, the idea that public education, we should have quality public education for all of our children, um, that value is what connected me to this community. So. I don't know if I'm really answering your question here, but um, yeah. No, you totally are. I think that's wonderful. And I think, and sorry, I, I wanna let Aron and Michael speak, but I have a follow-up question for you, but that's later, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I, um, 
I was thinking, yeah, about the imagining different worlds. I mean, I think Sarah G answered it so well in terms of uh, the last slide, right? Talking about abolition and the necessity for abolition, right? Because like, what is here, um, the system, right? Um, it's not working, right? What's here to protect us doesn't protect us, right? Most of us, right? <laughs> and so, yeah, there's such a need in the world to, to reimagine, right? And so um, for me, that's why I think the power of art and why art is so important, right? Is because art is the language, um, art is the medium for imagination, right? And so, and I think, you know, with my work, why do I, you know, that's why I create these, you know, voting stations for everyone who can't legally vote right and like making that very clear and centering the disenfranchise is that like obviously voting we talk about it as if everyone can vote but that's like a complete lie right and and like this research like it was so difficult to do because like it's it's not a question that's even being asked like i actually asked some like legit like r1 like researchers of voting rights, do you know who can't legally vote in this moment? And they literally could not answer it, right? And so like, I'm getting a little away from my point, but <laughs> the necessity is really great, right? And so, um, you know, in creating these voting stations for people who can't legally vote, you know, to reimagine this world uh, through art, we can make it physical, right? We could then, people can enter that world and, and and feel it and see it and engage with it in with their senses, right? Emotionally and mentally, right? And my hope is that once you enter that and once you feel that world, it's like up to us to make it real, right? And so like, that is really, I think what art can do. Yeah, and you know, I just wanna um, say that I loved the reimagined voting booths, like how a lot of them were made to be fun. And um, and I think like it, the way that, the thing I love so much about abolition is that you get to reimagine everything and that you don't have to, it's basically about doing everything differently. Like Ruthie Wilson Gilmore says, we have to change everything. And that sounds so hard, but there it's also like so exciting. It's like, why make the world, you know, boring and oppressive when we can make it beautiful and and fun, you know? And that's part of abolition. And we need that kind of imagination, which is why artists, I think, are so um, crucial to the work of abolition. Thank you both. And I think that's such a wonderful like way to enter this work right as arts educators right we're constantly thinking about how to promote creativity imagination but when we stretch it and we move away from using that work or that material to reinforce oppressive structures it really becomes a freeing experience and then these practices that you are are teaching us about like this really being able to enact this work with other people right it's not about an individual it's about collectively and i think both of you spoke to aspects of like vulnerability and really kind of sharing so much of yourself i mean sergio you really when we started you were talking about how you have seen this like growth in yourself as you became politicized over the past 10 years. And that is such a, a vulnerable kind of thing to say that we don't necessarily say publicly, right? This is a transformation that I've enacted. This is how I was guided through this process. And so for both of you to share some of those aspects, I think is really important. Um, as teaching artists, how do you cultivate kind of that, that sense or that space um, for, for you and for the people you collaborate and work with while also maintaining you know, and protecting yourself simultaneously, right? Because I think sometimes there's all of this giving, 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 and how do we create these balances of making sure that you are caring for yourself while you also do this labor to care for others? Yeah, that's an excellent question. Um, you know, I think like in terms of, I mean, I think as an extrovert and, and, um, <laughs> really seeking people. Um, I think, you know, like that sort of comes naturally for me, but I think like, you know, when other people are being vulnerable and how to hold space for that, you know, it, it, um, you know, and, and especially like 
making this sort of political work, like, you know, there's definitely a lot of people who enter my art spaces who don't agree with me, right? And how do I create space for other people who don't agree with me, even if they're coming from my own communities, right? And so I think, you know, for me, you know, it comes back to what we were, what we've already been talking about, right? Is that like, um, the way that I can hold vulnerability is to know that I think um, Adrian Marie Brown said this in a lecture I attended, but it's like, we are all victims of a system that doesn't love anybody, right? And so like, when I approach it that way, and maybe our politics aren't, al aren't aligned and maybe really conflicting, but it's like, I can, I can connect with other people and have compassion to understand that like, we're all part, we're all victims of the system, you know? And so, um, you know, and especially like as an educator, like myself uh, teaching at the college level, like a lot of students, yeah, they, they can say things that are pretty problematic, but to be able to like approach it as at, from this angle, right? That like we all, and Adrian Maria Brown says this too, is that we all like, you know, have to, we have to create these spaces or educators, abolitionists, right? Within movements, we could create these spaces that are, that, that hold space for our hurt, harmful and victim selves, right? And to be able to negotiate that with one another um, and be vulnerable with one another. Yeah, so I, I think a lot about, um, I mean, the name of my work is Love and Struggle. And so I think a lot about the role of love um, in the work um, as we struggle. And um, that's also part of being vulnerable with each other. And because we can't create things without being in relationship with each other. And to me, um, abolition, creating art, it's really about relationships. And the reason that we as a society need abolition is because of the way um, things like policing and prisons and surveillance have broken relationships, you know, like those are the things that isolate us from each other. Those are the things, you know, they're, they're forms of punishment and um, and punishment as a response to to harm is not going to um, change the conditions that may have contributed to the harm happening in the first place. So it, it's not going to create safety. Like if we are really concerned about safety and about um, eliminating violence, then just from the facts, prisons and policing, it doesn't work. Like those things do not make us any safer. In fact, you know, those things are what's violent, you know, those institutions themselves are forms of violence. And so um, when we talk about um, abolition, I think a huge part of that is about relationship building, like how, even just like in our interpersonal relationships, how do we learn to address harm with one another in ways that don't turn to a form of punishment um, where we're not, um, you know, where we're making people disposable, where we throw people away. And this is different from accountability. I think we definitely need accountability. And the thing is that accountability is love. And I don't think we see that, you know, we think of accountability as a form of punishment. But if we saw accountability as a gift and as a form of love that we give to each other and that we take for ourselves as love for ourselves, then I think that can, um, those are the steps that we need to create a world in which we don't have prisons and police, but also, you know, um, we are able to abolish, you know, the cops and prisons in our heads and in our hearts. So, yeah, I think um, definitely for me personally, um, doing that interpersonal work and within myself has been uh, really important in terms of how I look at abolition. Thank you. We have a question uh, from Alicia de Leon. Uh, she says, hi, and thank you for your presentations. I have a question. How do you grapple with utopic thoughts, reimagined worlds and the practical needs people have?
yeah, I mean that that um, that's a really great question, right? And I think you know I often um, you know create art, and my collaborators are often um, you know organizers and also um, like community resource centers. And there's definitely like a moment where sometimes they're like, we're sort of unable to, you know, do this more imaginative project with you because we have like to respond to getting food to people, right? <laughs> and like, those are real, right? And, but I don't necessarily think that, um, you know, they need to be, they need to, they're a binary, right? They're not like one or the other, right? And I think that, um, you know, but sometimes in, in our like crisis, um, in our world in crisis, like it definitely seems that way, right? But I think that like, you know, yeah, and it's so easy, right? And it makes, comp I mean, like, I don't know. It's a really great question. And I think that like, I, I wish it wasn't, you know, like a set up as a binary, right? And that, that I think, you know, that these imagination and uh, relationship building and love aren't like seen as like secondary, right? They're actually like really ne necessary, right? And should be seen as practical needs. But sometimes there are instances where like, a, a very specific response needs to come first. Yeah, I think um, I'm not really sure about the the term utopic, like utopia. Like, I think we kind of limit ourselves, you know, um, thinking that something might be utopic or unrealistic or idealistic. Um, and um, I, I keep thinking about how abolition of slavery, you know, like that was considered idealistic at one point, you know, and so many of the things that we have now were considered impossible, but people had to imagine it and they had to believe that it wasn't impossible. And I think that's part of our work, you know, um, and it's, part of our discipline. Um, Miriam often says, you know, hope is a discipline. And so that is part of my praxis is that I have to have hope and not like in this feeling kind of a way, but in the way that I act, like I'm going to act as if I believe that this is possible, even if, you know, all the facts may say otherwise. And I think that's crucial to anyone who's organizing for change, you know, is that believing that the things that look impossible now actually are possible. And at the same time, um, like Aram said, you know, it's not a binary where, you know, we can only be idealistic or we can only address, you know, the things that are in front of us. Like the, we can do both, you know, and I think we have to have that imagination and at the same time, you know, address things like there are concrete things we can do, like get cops out of schools. That's a really concrete thing that we can do that's very possible, you know, um, and that will take us that one step closer, you know, to, um, an abolitionist future. Yeah, and I also think about like, you know, you, with, with COVID-19, you know, all the really beautiful like mutual aid that's been happening, right? Like that's, 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 you know, using imagination, like creating like our own structures to like meet the practical needs of our own people, right? So like, I think, I think it could be done together and it should be, you know, and that's when it's the most powerful and beautiful. Thank you both. That was really, really lovely and really well put. <laughs> um, and like, I struggle to answer this way and you all just like succinctly like did it. <laughs> so I'm gonna come back to this recording often. Um, 
I think one of the other questions that we had or uh, that I thought about too is um, as artists who work at with multiple communities and multiple age ranges, um, how would you respond to perhaps people who, or what would be your advice rather to people who perhaps feel apprehensive dealing with or addressing these issues with um, maybe younger students or younger children? Um, because sometimes people might be like, well, you know, these, these are complicated issues. Children won't understand these things. Um, how do you engage in these discussions um, with communities at various levels? Um, I have so many feels about this. But like, <laughs> yeah, because um, I, I have a five-year-old and, um, you know, we talk about a lot of things together and actually, you know, in the beginning of the year, um, I was trying to homeschool them and, uh, and they use, you know, any pronouns, right. But prefer they, so, um, but like, that's a really great example, right. Is that like, even from a very young age, um, you know, they were going around and, being like boy girl and using using these or like gendering people right and having that conversation with a really young child to be like you can't make these assumptions you have to ask people and these are the pro you could do it by asking pronouns and these are the pronouns that you know some some people might answer in this sort of way and you need to remember it and honor it and not make these assumptions and it's like been really amazing like how how easily they were able to like then implement that and use that right and i think like um you know i talk about you because i think about like um you know so i ha have a degree in ethnic studies right from undergrad and like that's the time where i learned these words and learned about you know audrey lord books and like and learned about abolition and movements and it was like such an exciting moment for me and i think about if my child knows this, these words and these texts, like since a young age, like how can, like how empowering can that be, right? And that's like how I've been raising them. And like, it's been really amazing because, you know, they, yeah, they talk about capitalism all the time. And like, you know, I was just telling a friend this, like, I was like, hey, Nara, do you like this new dress that I bought? And Nara was like, mom, how come you love capitalism so much, right? And I was like, dad, called me out. You know, <laughs> <laughs> right? Um, but yeah, and like, they came up to me the other day and was like, uh, mom, you said that, you know, capitalism, um, you know, is part of white supremacy, uh, but we could fight against it, but we're all part of it too, right? And so like, pretty complex things like my child can definitely understand and like I'm excited to see like what skills and how they can call things out and how they can view the world like having these tools very early on yeah as a parent I totally agree um, my daughter is 16 now but she was little when I started um, documenting struggles in Chicago. And in the beginning, I would have to take her with me because I didn't, you know, I had no choice. And so she's been to so many protests with me. Um, and the way, and I was also like really conscious about not um, forcing things on her um, because I wanted her to come to um, these ideas like on her own, like I wanted them to be, I wanted it to be her ideas and her choice. But of course, you know, as a parent, I'm going to provide some guidance, you know. And so it's been, you know, um, it's been a balance of that. And in the beginning, she really was not interested in any kind of political discussion or, and as soon as she was old enough to stay home by herself, she made that choice. <laughs> But um, as a teenager now, you know, I'm watching her, like, especially as the protests erupted this past summer, like how she was in engaged and um, how meaningful it was for her, you know, to be able to participate. And like, I could see the light bulb go off, you know, 
And that was so cool to be able to see that. And also, I think that we don't give um, young people and children enough credit, you know, as Aram said, as to what they're capable of understanding. And the thing is that they really understand justice. Like I know that my ideas about justice I've had since I was a child, you know, they know about love, they know about fairness. And, and those are building blocks, you know, to what we talk about, you know, as adults. And, um, you know, capitalism is just, it's exploitation. And I think children understand that, you know? And so I don't think we should um, sugarcoat things for them and that it's unfair if we do that. And we need them to be our partners in reimagining this, this world that we wanna live in because I think that they could come up with a much greater world than we what we could possibly come up with. Yeah, and I think as, right, like working with so many different age groups throughout the years and um, right, working with both um, Aram and uh, Sarah's work, it's, it's, it's made those conversations very accessible, right? Like pictures, music and right how groups that you identify with like those are really accessible things for younger audiences um, right like look at this picture what do you see who's in these pictures what are the words that are there right what do you think this means um right and i think those are practices that like i've really tried to hone in on even with just the general history that we teach on a daily basis um right especially when it comes to things like um our queer history like when I first started um, talking about that at our museum and developing that research, it was always a question for uh, the group leaders, especially with younger audiences, like, hey, I'm going in this space. This is part of the history. How do you want me to handle it? But then we decided, you know what? No, we're not gonna do that. Like, this is the history. You know, children know about same-sex relationships in some capacity. And this is, it's really a disservice to not talk about these conversations with younger audiences. And once we started to, I remember a teacher telling me like, thank you so much because this student has same sex parents and now the other students are connecting with them and wanna know more about like, what's it like to have two moms or two dads, right? Because they have a mom and a dad, um, right? So I think totally what um, Aram and Sarah are saying, just like hit the nail on the head and, you know, exactly we don't give younger um, audiences enough credit in what they do know, um, right? Even, even trying to like filter them on certain things, like let them talk because more oftentimes than not, they're going to say something way more profound than what we say as educators and researchers doing this work for quite some time. Thank you so much for that, really. And I think it's like in centering these dialogues, we stop like making them other and we stop kind of giving them this like veil of like, ooh, you know, the spooky, like, but it becomes something that we can openly and very honestly and critically address together. Um, I have a, another question. Um, how do you all, what are the things that you really value um, in collaborations with, um, whether it's with schools, with or uh, museums, organizations, other collectives? Um, when you do this work with people, what are some of the key and important things that you value as artists that work with and alongside others? I'm just gonna jump in really quick because I know that Aram and Sarah are gonna like have so much to say about this, but um, I think just really echoing um, my previous point of accessibility, I think that's a huge one for anyone that we decide to work with because we want these conversations to be able to be um, accessible across the board to any age, race, you know, any category that you put yourself under. Um, and also just how people, um, see themselves in that work as well, right? I think that also is what really helps um, conversations happen is when people can see a glimmer of their own identity as part of that work. Um, and so that's been really great, you know, with everyone that we've um, partnered with past and, you know, moving forward in the present. Um, and so I know that's like one of our big um, like categories uh, at Hall House and work with people is just, what's the accessibility look like for this? And, you know, or how can we, change it to be more accessible to groups, right? Like what are the limitations that we can take away, but still keeping like the core value of that work? Yeah, with my projects, I, you know, I work with so many collaborators um, on each of the projects. And that's, that's really important to me because um, 
I, I really see collaborations as coalition building, right? And so like, that's really important for me that like, um, they can meet me there, we can, we can be part of something together, right? Um, part of creating a connection together and developing those relationships as Sarah G was talking about earlier, you know? And um, yeah, and, and, you know, a lot of it for me is like, I'm such a sucker for fun, right? So like, God, it's got to be fun to work together. <laughs> yeah, for for me, I think um, when I was part of For the People Artists Collective, um, and so we had to work with a lot of different organizations and we partnered with specific organizing struggles that were happening. Um, so it was a lot of like rapid response. Um, and I think what's important in those kinds of situations, and that's also a lot of my work is like, sometimes I'll get a text, you know, I'll get a signal message like at 8.30 in the morning, hey, we're gonna try to do this later. Can you be there to document, you know? And so in those kinds of situations, um, it helps to, already be in relationship with those people so that we have trust. Like for me, trust is crucial in the documenting work that I do because it, it's, it really puts the people in a vulnerable place to actually be documented by my camera. You know, for me, that's a trust that um, I take very seriously. And also um, having like valuing accountability, you know, like understanding that we're human beings and that there may be misunderstandings or maybe miscommunications, like especially when things happen fast, um, a lot can happen in a really short amount of time and um, having space to understand that um, and having the ability to, you know, admit when we, you know, messed up and being able to give each other space for that. Um, so also, also like having clear messaging, you know, and knowing what the expectations are with the people that I collaborate with, um, especially around messaging. Cause you know, if I'm documenting something, I wanna know what is the image that you want captured? Like, what is the story here? Um, what do you want people to see? Because after something is over, it's gonna it's gonna be the videos and the photos and the messaging um, that remain uh, from these protests and these actions. So that's really important. Um, and I just wanted to say around that I love your banners. Like I love how beautiful they are. And banners are so important as part of protests. Like I can't stress how important they are because when I go to an action and there are no banners and there are no signs, like. I don't know what to do with myself, you know? And it's so important for creating that visual of what are we saying here? Like, what do we want? Like, what do we wanna see happen? And banners, signs like those and art, you know, have a way of doing that really succinctly. Thank you all so much. Um, we can go ahead and open it up if anyone here in the audience has uh, any questions for our speakers. I think we can probably take maybe one, maybe two more questions if there are any. Don't be shy. Can I add quick, quickly to your yeah. question too? Is yeah, after hearing Sarah G talk about it. Um, also like, you know, cause a lot of, cause I work inside and outside of like museum and um, you know, higher ed and whatnot, right? And so like, I think um, trust is within the communities that, you know, like I'm centering is really important, right? For the collaborator to like bring, right? Because there's sometimes we're like an institution will be like, we want you to bring the purchase banner lending library. And for me, the, you know, at this moment, it's really important for me to like, work with organizers to like provide the support and you know get like make banners that they would actually use and like be able to gift them after them after the exhibition or whatnot right but then sometimes you know and i'll ask this, those institutions and sometimes there's like they're like glittery fancy institutions that i might have been like oh wouldn't that be great if i had a show at that place right but 
you know, I always ask the question of like, you know, it's really important for me that like organizers can can access this library, right? Do you have relationships with them? And then and then sometimes they will, but sometimes they'll say no, right? We were hoping that you could do that with your work, right? And it's like, no, that's really your job as the institution. And I can help strengthen that bond. Um, but if you don't have that connection or trust with that, with the groups that I want to work with, like you need to go work on that and let's talk about this in six months, right? And it never really does come back to a conversation in six months when I do say that, right? And so like, yeah, I think like working with um, disenfranchised communities and working with people, you know, in communities that are other, like a lot of institutions right now are like, we need to, we need to bring them in, but like, don't have that trust, don't have those relationships to like really bring our people in, you know? So it's really important to work on that and like to really be committed to that because you need to build trust. Thank you. Are there any questions from our audience members? Uh, yeah, I actually had a question. Um, I, uh, I really kind of perked up when uh, Ram mentioned this idea of uh, fun, but also like play. And I think that's so important in engaging a community but it's also incredibly difficult to manage. Uh, like when you when you think of uh, this event or this activity that you want to do to engage a community, and you're like, oh, I want this to be fun. Uh, then you like you actually have to think incredibly long and hard about how to actually make it fun for for a wide audience and for a wide variety of people. Um, so I'd love to hear more about kind of like managing that when it comes to developing a project or developing some sort of event that you want to bring to a community uh, in order to, of course, help bring it together and also to empower that community. Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, I think it's like, I don't know. I, um, I think fun and play are pretty easy, actually. Cause like, it's all a part of us, right? We just have to like create that safe environment where like we can let it out, right? And so, um, you know, like I said, I'm, I'm, I'm very much an extrovert and um, I make really bad jokes, you know? <laughs> I'm really good at um, making fun of myself, but uh, you know, I, and I think like art, for me, I think that's also why like it's so fun to make art with people together because actually like when we're making art together, it's pretty freaking fun, right? It's like pretty hard for it not to be fun in my opinion, right? And so like, you know, and of course there's like so many things that can help with the fun, right? Like, um, yeah, bringing my kid to the workshop and like their friends. So there's like little ones running around, right? That's fun. Uh, music. Right. And so, um, yeah, music, snacks, dude. Right. Like things like that. Right. And I think there's certain things that like, you know, definitely disrupt the fun. Right. So like um, sometimes, you know, and sometimes that's about the space we're in. Right. So like if they want me to do like a really crazy active workshop in a very like sterile museum, like that's harder right? Because like already for my people, like to go to a museum is already like a strange, weird place that like people don't know the etiquette, right? So like, like that's also why, you know, doing things outdoors or in like more open public spaces, like that lends to the fun, right? Um, and, and like, yeah. And, you know, I think like, I think it's, yeah, definitely when you're making art together, in my opinion, like those workshops are just like, people have a lot of fun with it, you know? It's so funny cause like, I'll do like sewing workshops, right? And people are just like learning how to sew like this and everyone's like quiet AF, right? And they're going like this. And then I'm like, how's it going? And people were like, oh, this is so much fun, right? And it's like, I can't tell. <laughs> awesome. 
It was very quiet in the library when that happened. (laughs) That like intense focus, but it's like, you're so into it, but like, yeah. (laughs) Well, thank you all so much. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Ross at the Hull House Museum. Thank you, Sarah G. Thank you, Aram Hansi Fuentes. Um, We are so glad that you were all able to join us this afternoon. Uh, We are forever grateful to you all. This is so informative, super great. Um, the recording will be up on our um, on the conference website, and then hopefully we can get a copy of that to share so that other people can also partake and listen to this really, really wonderful conversation. Thank you so, so much for being here. Have a really great rest of your day. And please uh, check out the um, Hull House Museum. There are links both in the chat box here and on the website. You can also check out loveandstrugglephotos.com and you can also check out Aram Hansi Fuentes' website. Um, they are wonderful, like, collection like group of wonderful people and please please continue to check out their work um thank you so much